city, blah, 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 30 years of blah, 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 and where has that led us? Welcome to tonight's Meaning It. For decades, the fossil fuel industry has been sowing seeds of doubt about the viability of replacing dirty oil, coal and gas with clean energies like solar and wind. But COP26 saw several significant promises heading in the right direction. For example, the US promised to cut its methane emissions by 30% by 2030 compared to 2020 levels. And no, not by masking its cows, but by targeting its methane leaks from oil and gas pipelines and offshore rigs. And several dozen other countries have now also signed up to this pledge. But perhaps the most exciting and immediately impactful promise is an initiative from the Global South, which could bring clean energy to billions of people. And this initiative is what tonight's show focuses on. Its roots go back more than seven years, and it has landed now, at last, at COP26. Climate change, indeed biodiversity loss, are the biggest challenges that are facing humanity right now. And the reality is the uh, warning lights are flashing bright red. It simply makes me very angry to think that just to protect the profits of some large fossil fuel corporations, we have to impose utter disaster on nation after nation, starting with the poorest nation. In response, the green energy revolution we've all been waiting for is well underway. Clean energy from sun and wind, which of course don't cause climate change, have become decisively cheaper than dirty fossil fuels. And they're available in abundance. In fact, the sun offers us more energy in an hour than we use in an entire year. And there's enough wind to power the globe 10 times over that has now brought us to this energy transition and the green energy revolution, what is it promising us? It's promising us reliable, low-cost energy in abundance, both distributed and central generated, which allows us to transform economies and ultimately it is also allowing us to save lives because of the climate change, which will have an unimaginable impact. So renewable energy seems unarguably the way forward. But some people still see a problem. The sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow. So is this intermittency its fatal flaw? The problem is that most people are thinking too small scale. Most people are thinking about renewables just within their nation state. We have to think in continental terms. We have to plug everybody into, into the solar power and often good wind power that you find in deserts. Just imagine that you, that, that you drew a box in the desert 150 kilometers by 150 kilometers and fill that box with solar power stations. You could produce all the electricity that Europe produces today from all its sources, from all its power stations. From a technical point of view, it's perfectly easy to power the world from renewable energy. What you do is you build long distance transmission lines using high voltage direct current lines that can transmit power over thousands of kilometers with very little loss to link us all to the areas where r renewable energy is most abundant. So intermittency wouldn't be a problem if we could get our energy from wherever the sun is shining or the wind is blowing places far away, but just how far away? We're talking about up to 6,000 kilometers. So that's like from the middle of the Sahara to London or Berlin. Yeah, 6,000 kilometers. So in terms of uh, technology development and practice, actually the global energy interconnection is feasible. It is feasible now. It is feasible now. But the electricity flow needs to be controlled precisely. How can we switch it from wherever it's most abundant and therefore cheapest to wherever it's most needed with split-second precision? 
and at any given moment of the day or night? The answer is smart grids. And in Professor Zhang's lab, they're developing smart grids that can control these energy flows very precisely. So if you combine long distance power lines with smart grids and clean energy, you get the global energy interconnection. And if this vision is realized, it'll be able to supply electricity day or night across Asia and Africa and the Middle East, all the way into Europe, the Americas, and the Antipodes. Uh, and the electricity grid needs to become a little bit more like another grid that we have all got used to using and all take for granted now, and that's the information internet. In the information internet, anybody from the largest provider of information, Google or Amazon, to the smallest individual blogger can feed in information into the global network. Anybody can draw information out of the global network wherever they are. And it needs to be the same with energy, that anybody can feed in from their rooftop solar panels or from a giant desert solar power station, and anybody can access the renewable energy that's being fed in in the same way. And the information internet crosses borders. It's a global creation that we now all use, and it needs to be the same with energy. We have to think beyond the nation state, share our clean energy resources, in order for everyone to have a reliable supply of unlimited, cheap, clean energy. For a flexible, secure uh, energy future, which I see as the cost-effective one and as the sustainable one, then interconnection is just an absolutely central part of that. And it is clear already that the technology uh, and the cost of that interconnection is there and we should be able to move over to a de decarbonised energy system. What is stopping that is those old companies, usually fossil fuel based, sometimes they have a bit of nuclear in there, but they're fundamentally fossil fuel based. They are without doubt trying to slow down that change uh, in order that they maintain their market share for as long as possible. It simply makes me very angry to think that just to protect the profits of some large fossil fuel corporations and please some government leaders who are raking in the cash from the fossil fuel industry or just, just because other government leaders can't be bothered confronting vested interests to change, change the energy system. We have to impose utter disaster on nation after nation, starting with the poorest nations. The people who are the first victims of climate change are the poorest because they have no resources to fall back on. So Bangladesh, one of the poorest nations of the world in which we work, is facing utter annihilation from the rising seas combined with, with floods coming down from the mountains as the ice melts. Why do we have to cause famine, disaster, superstorms, floods, and, and have whole nations disappear? There's absolutely no need for it. We're just doing it to please certain vested interests. Governments could make this transition without annoying their voters. Most voters would be perfectly happy if the power that comes out of their plug comes from renewable energy rather than fossil fuels. The voters aren't the problem. The problem is lack of leadership. So Nick Dunlop came up with a striking solution to create a forum where political leaders from around the world could build momentum together for this clean energy transition. And he called it the Climate Parliament. Climate Parliament is a network of politicians, of members of parliament, legislators around the world. In each parliament where we are active, we bring together legislators and they come from all political parties. This isn't a party political issue. Members of parliament generally are not specialists. They're generalists because they have to deal with all kinds of issues. But what they are specialists at is getting governments to do things. That's what they're the experts at. And that's what we need to do. We don't have a problem with technology. We have all the technologies we need to solve the climate problem tomorrow. 
the world is, is, is full of engineers, brilliant engineers who, who know how to build this stuff. We don't have a shortage of engineers. What we have a shortage of is political leadership. She's OK with that? Yes, she's OK. okay. It's summer 2015, and the climate parliament is meeting in the run-up to the Paris COP. They're focusing on designing the proposal they're taking to the world leaders in Paris, which includes both large-scale continental grids and micro-scale grids for villages in the global south, drawing on local clean energy resources, and they're calling it the Green Grids Initiative. The Paris summit, COP21. It's the 21st time world leaders have met in response to the climate catastrophe. Will they move decisively towards renewables this time, away from the old familiar lure of fossil fuels? What would it take to make this change? You're reaching consensus among almost 200 governments, many of which are oil companies, uh, uh, in effect, dressed up as governments. I think of the US Congress, many of whose members are basically in the pocket of the US uh, coal and oil industries. How do we make sure that we hold the feet of governments and then companies to the fire? There are always three elements. I mean, the first is you need leadership. Um, the second is you need civil society support and you need people mobilised to deliver these things. Justice! Justice! Surrounding the COP, thousands of civil society protesters are demanding clean energy to reduce carbon emissions and to bring about energy justice. justice. And you need the power of a good idea. You know, and the kind of work that Nick is doing is putting into the furnace of change the kinds of good ideas that will enable civil society to mobilise and that will enable us to, to support leaders. Leaders can become very isolated. You know, leaders need to be supported. They need to have, they need to have the people on their side. For the Climate Parliament, Paris is an opportunity to recruit support for the initiative from key leaders like the Energy Minister of Costa Rica. This is uh, uh, one of the slides uh, used for a global energy internet. Each region links up into a regional grid um, to trade renewable energy across borders. And for Costa Rica, this works on two levels. One is uh, that Costa Rica, as a major renewable energy leader, can benefit from the interconnections and can often be an exporter, but also can have more energy security because when it's cloudy or not windy, you can be importing. So, so in principle, I like the idea. Another crucial partner for the Green Grids initiative is India. It's setting the pace with its One Sun, One World, One Grid initiative, which is now building energy interconnections right across the subcontinent and beyond to Southeast Asia, the Gulf, Africa, aiming for regional grids across every continent. Our government is very clear in its mind about our obligation to the coming generations, about our need to leave behind a greener planet for our great-grandchildren. That's what this revolution is about. And that's why Yesterday, when Nicholas met me, I said that, uh, you know, we, uh, we are so happy to partner with you because you are engaged in a cause which is important for the whole planet. Until unless we convince our parliaments, until unless we convince all our brethren across the world, I don't think that we have a very bright future ahead of us. So the time is now. And that's why I believe, Nicholas, that your initiative is important and urgent. It's this sense of importance and urgency that drives the next meeting of the Climate Parliament at the UK Foreign Office's Wilton Park. We have the technology we need right now to fix this problem. And, and we have no shortage of renewable energy resources. We could power 10 world economies on solar power alone. We could power 10 world economies on wind power. But we can only harness that massive potential if we have enough long-distance transmission lines. The idea is catching fire, with potential interconnections being explored all around the world. Our, our, our plan is that the, to connect the Kyushu with the Busan, and also Busan to connect to Matsue. And then China, China, Korea is like this one yeah. that we are planning. Uh, 
things solar energy from mm -hmm. North Africa to to Europe. So p perhaps that there, there may be uh, not only could North Africa share its clean energy with Europe, there are plans too for Africa-wide power lines. I think the potential is amazing. I think if there's one place that is suited to green grids is Africa. We are not bogged down with 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 existing infrastructure, for instance, that that might make us be look at legacy and hold on to things that were there for us a long time ago. We could leapfrog right into the green grids concept and start from scratch and get it right and become, you know, the cutting edge continent for renewable energies using the concept of green grids and sharing of our resources and trading in our in our resources. And that could be our our oil, that could be our our you know exportable resource to, to to Europe and the rest of the world. You know, our planet has given us everything. Perhaps it's just how we share it, how we collaborate on some of these resources that is the answer to the want in one place and the abundance in others. That means we have to, in developing countries, double, redouble, and double again the electricity supply because development is, is work and work requires energy and it would be completely unjust if, if the world's poor were not able to have the, the energy supplies that have lifted the rich countries out of poverty in generations past. This is the big event that we've been waiting for for some years when the leaders of the world come together to commit very specifically to building the new large-scale generating capacity for wind, solar and other renewables, to building the large continental scale grids and inter-regional grid connections that we need, right down to solar panels on every roof and solar microgrids for African and Asian or Latin American villages. We've got to do this incredibly fast. And in order to do that, we need uh, uh, to really step up the level of political will, political energy behind these efforts. And that is what we're aiming to do in Glasgow. A Green Grids initiative became a reality when India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi launched One Sun, One World, One Grid to share renewable energy right across the world. The One Sun, One World, One Grid or Green Grid initiative ke samanje se ek sayukta aur sudrad a worldwide grid will enable us to provide clean energy everywhere at all times. It will also reduce the need for storage and it will also increase the viability of solar projects. This creative initiative will not only reduce carbon footprint and the cost of energy, it will also open up new avenues for cooperation between different regions and different countries. I'm confident that the harmonization between One Sun, One World, One Grid and the Green Grid Initiative will help in developing a joint and robust global grid. So it's real now, Nick, after all those years of work. I would say we, we've had a big day. Um, we saw the Prime Minister of India stand up, introduced by the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom and, and present uh, uh, the, uh, the, the initiative that we've been working on and designing and thinking about for years. Um, uh, we saw them show a film about the Green Grids Initiative, One Sun, One World, One Grid. And, you know, even a year ago, I would have uh, I would have been pleasantly surprised if you had told me that was going to happen today. We've seen France and the United States join the ministerial steering group. They've just confirmed in the last few weeks. This is all taking shape quite quickly. We've seen the African Union co-sponsor the Africa Working Group with the African Development Bank, and I, I'm sure the African Union will agree to represent the African continent. There'll be representatives from ASEAN, from Latin America, um, Germany and Australia attended the first meeting of the, the high-level steering group of the initiative, uh, of the government-to-government -government initiative, which happened a few days ago. Germany has to be an observer until now because uh, they just have a caretaker government while a new coalition is being installed. Uh, but uh, certainly uh, we're, we're hopeful that Germany will also join that 
high-level leadership group. And many, many other countries have expressed interest. It's been the declaration that was issued today has been endorsed by more than 80 member states of the International Solar Alliance. A number of others, like Ireland, one of my own countries of nationality, has said we're definitely going to participate in this. Many others have expressed strong interest. Um, Kenya is another one that isn't a member state of the International Solar Alliance. So it's really, we're seeing a bit of a snowball effect. Uh, we have a big opportunity to use this as a platform, as a vehicle, to step up the pace in the global energy transition and actually get the new green grid infrastructure and the new solar power stations and the new offshore wind farms that we need to be building on an emergency uh, basis that we need to be building at a, at a tremendous pace if we're going to uh, save ourselves and future generations from a climate disaster. We have a chance to do that, but but it'll only work if we all work on it. Um, so uh, this is just the beginning, really, even though the climate parliament has put years of work into getting to this point. It's really just the beginning, and we have to now buckle down and keep pushing the governments to to uh, work together like never before, to mobilize finance, working with the international agencies um, and uh, you know, start building that new clean energy infrastructure in every part of the world at, at a pace never seen before. The focus of the world leaders so far has been on the large scale delivery of energy for business. But of course, it's essential to make sure the clean energy needs of the world's people are also met, which means not having just clean energy, but fair energy, energy that everyone has access to, and at a fair price, not an exploitative one. We need energy justice, where communities have energy sources under their control. Will the old established political systems keep their control over the energy systems? Or can we make sure renewable energy is fairly shared? Back at the Paris COP in 2015, I caught up with Lydie Nakpil, a campaigner for climate justice for the people of the Philippines, and I asked her particularly about energy justice. At the local level, um, we help strengthen the fights of local communities against dirty energy and also push for the promotion of renewable energy, uh, but renewable energy that is under the control of people and communities, because there's also some push for renewable energy that is under corporate control. So basically the same kind of system where, which we have for the current system where it's controlled by corporations. Why is this important? Why is it important that people control? Well, <clears throat> because we believe that if unless uh, energy, control of energy is made more democratic, then what will happen even under a renewable energy system is that a big majority of our people will not have access. Um, it's not just simply what type of energy, it has to be energy that serves the people, the communities, their basic needs. Here in the Philippines, there is stark evidence of the effects that climate change is already having, especially on the lives of the poorest families. The first struggle is to really survive, to put food on the table. Climate change was no longer simply an environmental issue. It's very much a, an issue of survival for many of the communities in the Philippines. Crops being destroyed in the rural areas, in the, in the cities, you know, whole communities just being destroyed because their houses are swept away. People begin to think, well, that's the way the world has been and will always be and we can't really do anything. So that's one of the first we need to address, that there is something we can do and things can change and will change. So that's it for tonight's show. See you tomorrow.